Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Romina Itron, Senior Vice President, and with me is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communications. So Tim, uh, let's finish the story here. Last week, the legislature got sworn in, but there were two races still undecided. Who ended up getting sworn in and are they still there? Well, we have developments in both of them. So within the past week was the deadline for county registrars to certify the results of the election. So theoretically, barring recounts, we have the final results. So in the 47th district, Greg Wallace, the Republican, beat Christy Holstedge, the Democrat, by about 80 votes. And then in the Senate seat, um, Melissa Hurtado, who was the Democratic incumbent, beat David Shepard by about 20 votes. Now, both of those races are likely going to go into a recount. So in the assembly, um, even though Wallace won and Wallace has declared victory, well, it's up to the Democrats in the assembly to decide who gets sworn in. So obviously they're not rushing to swear in him. And Holstage put out a statement, kind of a vague statement, basically saying, we're evaluating our options. We'll get back to you later. But in the Senate, with the Democrat winning by 20 votes, she actually was sworn in over the weekend. So now, even though there are questions about um, some of the procedures and what's going on, and it seems very likely that Shepard is going to file uh, for a recount, um, she's collecting a check. In a recount, it could reverse the results of the election. Helping out uh, one of your own is more important than waiting to see actually who the voters elected. Yes. Funny how that works, Tim. (laughs) Yes. Any history of this? It seems like it happens more and more uh, during recent elections. Well, historically, who's ahead gets sworn in. So it's actually more surprising they didn't swear in either one on Monday. You know, it has happened before where um, somebody won and was sworn in and then a recount reverse the results and the other person ended up winning. And then that person, you know, who thought they won, but ended up losing, ended up just forfeiting the office. So that's what would happen, you know, if Shepard comes back and, you know, ends up winning, well, Hurtado would just forfeit the seat, you know, and then they would swear him in. So it's not a usual thing. It's only happened a handful of times, but yeah, typically when there's a very close election, um, the winner sworn in, you know, the leader on on swearing in day is sworn in, especially if the leader is in the majority party. Now, Newsom last week called for um, the legislature for a, a special session to decide this this windfall profits tax, which now they're calling the, the price gouging penalty uh, to make it more palatable, I guess. I don't know if I were president of an oil company, I'd rather people think that my company earned windfall profits versus uh, being known as a price gouger. So what are the prospects for this bill? Um, The bill was introduced at Senate Bill 2X. I think the legislature probably views it somewhat skeptically. I mean, obviously, the bill was introduced and we're going to have hearings on it. And, you know, a a, a committee will fully vet the bill before votes are taken. I think that all Democrats want to be seen as doing something. uh, And certainly the oil industry, you know, on some of these cases, you know, doesn't do themselves any favors. However, they know deep down what a proposal like this means, because the solution to this problem is we need to encourage more oil production in California. And when you push measures like these, you're doing just the opposite. You're discouraging oil production in California. I'd be very surprised if they turn down the governor's proposal, and certainly they can introduce their own measures. Um, you're, you're not limited to just what the governor proposes in a special session. You're just limited to the subject area that he called the special session for. I think they're going to give it their due diligence. I don't, I don't see them rushing to pass this when they come back in January. The bigger issue for me is not whether the Democrats will enact some version of what Newsom's proposed. It's the legal issues afterward, because you made the point, you know, is this a penalty? Is this a tax? Is this a fee? And they're very, um, that matters in the state constitution. So I predict you're going to see whatever is passed, if it's something along this road and as a quote penalty, I think you're going to see that heavily 
litigated for months to come after it's signed into law. And as our Carrie Jackson writes this week on Right by the Bay, you know, yes, it's typical that gas prices fall with this winter blend, but we're still paying a lot more than the rest of the country because of all the taxes and fees and, um, you know, the other California only policies that make gasoline more expensive in our state. So how about introducing our new guest? Uh, this is going to be a great guest, folks. We Tim really got a, a great, uh, great interview here. So our guest this week, and it's kind of a special holiday edition, I would, I would say, as we as we get uh, close to the twenty fifth, is Dottie Pepper. And for those of you who are a fan of golf, you know that about Dottie. She's a seventeen time LPGA champion, two time winner of what was the Dinah Shore, a major tournament uh, that was played for years here in um, uh, the Palm Springs area. And now she is a commentator every week. She's the lead on-course uh, reporter for CBS Sports' golf coverage. And Dottie has uh, produced a terrific book called Letters to a Future Champion. And it was one of the top picks on PRI's holiday book list last year. And it, it's the story of letters that she wrote back and forth with her mentor, Mr. Pulver. And so you really get, it's one of the most beautiful books you, you, you'll see. You actually see the um, the letters uh, produced in, in, in the book. And the book was designed, ironically, here in Sacramento. Um, but you see kind of... Um, Kind of her formative years becoming um, the great champion that she became, learning from her mentor, Ms. Mr. Pulver. Uh, and you you see it in real time as she's in college and, you know, rising the ranks in her uh, initial tournament. So it's a great book, A, if you love golf, but B, even if you're not a golf person, you know, if you're interested in mentorship and leadership, there are all sorts of things you can you can take away from, from the book. So we talk about her book. We talk about the process of writing a book. And this was her project during COVID. So you hear about her book writing process, hear about all her favorite books. But then we talk about, because we're a think tank, we can't not talk about policy. We get her thoughts on some of the hot issues with athletes like taxes and name image likeness, which is a big issue in um, for especially college athletes. So I think you'll find it a very interesting uh, discussion. Yes, I thought so too. And I actually went out and bought it for a couple of friends of mine who love golf for, for Christmas presents. So thanks very much, Tim, for that great idea of having her. And here's Dottie Pepper. Hi, Dottie. Welcome to PRI's Next Round Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I've, I've looked forward to this. I've been uh, fans of all of yours, and now it's a chance to just kind of do this semi-live. So we're so happy to have you on Next Round to talk about your terrific book, Letters to a Future Champion. But before we talk about that, we are a think tank, so we have to talk a little bit of policy. And sure. there's, actually, there's actually some policy issues related to athletes, and many of these debates originated actually here in Sacramento. So first, let's talk about taxes. Californians know all too well just how costly and uncompetitive our state tax burden is. But but as we've written at PRI, taxes also make us uncompetitive for attracting top pros like yourself. So looking back on your career, how big of an issue was taxes in your decision and the decision of your, your contemporaries for, for where to live, uh, what tournaments to play, and, and where to set up your uh, your business interests. And based on your conversations with PGA and LPGA tour players in your media work, how much of a factor is taxes in the thinking of today's players about where to locate? Well, um, you, you mentioned California, but I also live in the state of New York. So I'm <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not escaping anything where I've chosen to live. And it's it's back where I, I grew up. But certainly it was a factor where I chose to live while I was playing my my time on tour. I think I was in the state of New York for a year and a half, partly because of weather. I went south to Florida, but not hiding behind it. It was also because of taxation. Uh, and it was, a, it was a big part. I got I was uh, audited when I left the state of New York, so that was rather uncomfortable. Not a whole lot of fun to go through. Uh, but I think I've I've never really heard it impact so much about players' schedule uh, because you're not going to you're not going to miss a major championship be just because it's in California. Right? We paid we played all, every year that I was a professional. I uh, played the 
Edina, the, the Kraft Nabisco, the now what's Chevron in Texas, but all of those years it was in Palm Springs and you just knew the tax bill was coming. And there were other states actually that t- chased players down as well. Um, when we played New Jersey, the next week there was a letter from the, from the governor in your mailbox um, on, on tour saying, we know you were played in the tournament and expect to you to pay what you were, um, oh, so what you're the liable for. The oh, it was following a- week? Oh my goodness. It was awesome. And Vermont was exactly the same way. Uh, they knew in that Stratton Mountain, Mountain event was being played that the players were in town uh, in their state and they were going to get their fair share, but they reminded you that they were going to come after you if, if you weren't good about it. So um, yeah, they, they knew you were there, but I think it affects more where you choose to live, where you choose to set up a business rather than your playing schedule. So another debate that we've covered here at PRI is name, image, and likeness, which is yeah. a big issue for athletes at the collegiate level. And it's a debate that really kicked into high gear here in the California legislature. I believe we were the first state to pass uh, a law on the issue and then the Supreme Court weighed in. So in your view, how is this kind of new name image likeness regime either helping or hurting collegiate players and other collegiate athletes today? And thinking back to your time, as a star collegiate golfer at Furman, how do you think your life and career might have been impacted if today's name image likeness rules had been in effect? I will be straight up with you and say I didn't think it was a very good idea when it came out um, because I know how uh, yeah NCAA, it can be corrupt. It can be nasty. Um, but I've also, um, my eyes, I think, were widened when I went down to the University of Alabama to spend some time with the women's golf team. And there was uh, a stipend. The players, especially the football players, were given um, to help with the, the basics of just being a student, being on campus, um, having enough money to go home for the holidays, having enough money to do your laundry off campus. Campus. So things like that, because a lot of those those student athletes came from from families that didn't have the means to to provide um, that sort of cushion for, or budget for their kids. Um, I was on a, on a super tight budget as a as a uh, college player, and I, and I think there are good elements to the name, image, and likeness. Um, can it get twisted? Absolutely. You got a player now, f- football, a quarterback at, at Wake Forest, and he could potentially make more money next year. It just was actually just released today. And the, his coach talking about it, he could actually make more money next year if he signs the right thing with the right school than he could go into the NFL uh, as a fourth round draft pick. So that's that to me is kind of crazy, but it would have made my life better if I could have struck up a, a relationship with a with a local car dealer. Or maybe I wouldn't have had a car starting out with a hundred thousand miles on it. <laughs> there could have been there could have been some positives to it. Uh, but I think as with so many things, finding the right balance is the key. So you've got to be able to help some of those kids have a decent lifestyle, but somehow stay out of the nastiness and somehow it can be not really in the spirit of certainly of amateur athletics. So Daddy, let's talk about your book. Uh, Letters to a Future Champion was one of the top picks on on PRI's holiday book list, thanks to Tim. Uh, You write in the book that it was uh, uh, working with your dad at a a nine-hole pitch and putt golf course and drinking uh, and driving range that that he started and and operated um, that piqued your interest in golf. And, And it was, quote, expanded state and federal regulations, unquote, putting your family's turkey farm on out of business that set him uh, on the path to opening the course in the first place. So tell us a story. How did government overregulation indirectly put Dottie on the path to becoming a champion golfer? Well, uh, they came in, the state came in right around Thanksgiving um, in the early 70s. I think it was 70, 70 or 71, if I'm not mistaken, and um, said you have to institute all of these new health and gui- health guidelines, which would have, I mean, the dollar amount of money even back then is was staggering for what they were going to do. But there was also legislation in Washington, D.C. at the time that was lobbied heavily and backed by big, big farming. Uh, so it was turkey farmers and chicken farmers across the country. Small operations were put out of business um, in a back sort of way, this way. And it was um, it was enough for my grandmother to, I guess, put the telephone message out when they called Pepper's Turkey Farm to say, uh, thanks to the state of New York and legislation that was pushed through, uh, we will no longer be in business starting tomorrow morning. And 
click. Um, it was, it still causes Ajita in our, in our family, no, no doubt. Um, but it was for me, it turned out to be a silver lining because the farm was so big. We, we, we processed 45,000 turkeys a year, raised them and, and processed them. There was a lot of land. So there was that land to make that, that nine hole pitch and putt course and that 300 yard driving range. And that was where I, I honed my skills and I met and worked with George Pulver so closely. So letters to a future champion really is a very touching tribute to your mentor, Mr. Pulver. And, and, and reading through, it. There are so many great lessons that golfers and non-golfers alike can take from the book and learn about mentorship and, and, and leadership. So maybe for our, our, our listeners who aren't familiar with, with your book, you know, share a little bit about who Mr. Pulver was and, and why you were so inspired to write a book about him. Well, Mr. Pulver was a World War I veteran, uh, founder of the Northeastern New York PGA section. He was a, a, a golf writer at, at one point, um, graduated from Albany Business School when he came back from the war uh, and really learned his his craft through a man by Seymour Dunn, whose family had ties all the way back to the beginning of golf in Scotland. And I was very blessed to have lived in this area where he was he was kind of golf royalty. He and his wife, Martha, were, were definitely golf royalty in this area. Um, not only as a player, he was a very, very good player, but as a teacher, as a golf course architect, as an agronomist, as a, as a club maker. And when you have the opportunity to, to work with someone who is so well-versed in so many parts of anything, you you can't help but I think have um, you get a lot of it that that trickles down and I and I was able to do that but and he was as Martha passed away at the beginning of 1981 he had a big hole in his his time and his life um, in his heart and it, it turned out to the 14 and 15 year old girl was what filled that uh, so he was he was very free to pass along the things he knew about the game what he knew would be important in my life away from golf um, primarily education being curious and and it was just it was a it was a magical relationship. So reading through Letters to a Future Champion, it's perhaps one of the most visually beautiful books that anyone could read. Um, and thumbing through the pages, you get to read all the letters between you and Mr. Pulver, which are reproduced in the book. And you also get to follow along the story of a, of a future champion and do so from letters li- written in, in real time as, as events and your life are happening. So looking back, what one key lesson from Mr. Mr. Pulver was perhaps a, the most interesting influential in developing you as a as a future champion and whether what other lessons inspired you in your very successful media career and in your life well i'm going to take you guys back you've mentioned sacramento already a couple of times and tell you that the book was designed by a guy who lives in sacramento uh, martin miller who had done a lot of work with my husband on some previous projects uh, and done a a lot of shooting and uh, printing of phenomenal photos uh, at augusta national and and really um, some significant work all across golf, but I was fortunate enough to have Martin jump on the project as a designer, and he did a remarkable job. Um, it was very personal for him. He got the importance of, of the relationship, and it was really wonderful to work with a friend. Um, but I, I think a lot of things that Mr. Pulver talked about were not just about playing golf or working on the fundamentals of a, of a golf swing. They were about uh, nurturing a, a girl with big dreams uh, that, you know, she was, in some ways, I was urged to turn professional very early that would have afford- gone a four-year college degree. Uh, He was very much against that. Uh, But he also stressed how important it was to be properly prepared for whatever you're doing and have a balance in your life so that it's not all just golf, especially for kids. It's not over early specialization for for kids we see so often now. Um, He was, as we talked, Nick Nick Boletari has recently passed. He was so anti-Boletari in the way he taught and the way those kids didn't really have a life so early. Um, He really believed that, that sports should be an addition to your life, not a compromise to it. So those are really the things that uh, I really wanted to get across as as we went through the process of of sharing those letters that went back and forth between both of us in that that journey that we had for six and a half years. So our listeners may not realize that Letters to a Future Champion was actually a project that you undertook while you were stuck at home during COVID. Now, here at PRI, we can identify with how painstaking it can be to edit and write and publish books as we produce so many books and studies every year. And we can imagine doing so during COVID was even more challenging. So tell us a little bit about your book writing and and publishing process. And after all the work that you've put into this book, 
Is this one and done for you or is there another book in your future? <laughs> I'll answer your last. And yes, I believe this is one and done, but it really wasn't the only book I've run. I, I did three children's books with a, with a co-author in Virginia Beach. And that was a project earlier, uh, mid, uh, late tooth. Uh, I'll see. I left, I left NBC in 2012. So it was around 2011 to 2014 that we did those, those three really um, impactful junior golf books about, and, and the, the stories were about being true to yourself. And it was also, uh, it tackled the, the, really nasty subject of bullying. So we used golf uh, with kids to t teach them the good things about the game, but also some really important things going on in their lives. But uh, it was a challenge to do this book during the lockdowns, but it was also a blessing because it gave me something very positive to work on. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Sitting, sitting in your basement, going through piles and piles and piles of clippings and, and art magazine articles and uh, pulling up records from the Saratoga Springs High School, uh, going into the county records, trying to um, getting Mr. Pulver's enlistment papers. All, all of those things were, it was, a, it was a great thing to have something that was so positive, but it was also so positive to take that on the road when we did go back to being in live sports again in, in June of 2020, because we weren't allowed to go. Any. Not that there was much where to go, but we, you would go from work work to your hotel room. And that was it. So I had a great project to work on for the months that we were on the road. I drove a lot. Um, my notebook was right back with me again. And, and I fortunately, the editor, I decided to self-publish, but my editor freed everything up by with one sentence. Um, it was right around 4th of July. I was starting to struggle. We'd gotten through two or three chapters and I was really starting to get bogged down. I think probably trying to be a little too perfect with what I put down. And he said, Dottie, please just put everything down. It doesn't have to be perfect. Put it all down. We can always go back and edit. We can take things out. We can dig deeper if, we, if when we go back through the editing process that we feel like we should take a deeper dive. Just put it all down. And that opened the floodgates for me. So all said and done, uh, we were 11 months almost to the day turning it in and we beat the deadline to get to the printer by two days. That's great, Dottie. You have no, I, I was a former editor and you, you don't you have no idea how, how, uh, how much I spent my day pleading with the authors, please get your book in. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. no, we did it. We yeah. did it. Um, and, and I think again, part of it too, there was, there were the highs and lows of, of the lockdowns because we never all sat together. Martin is the designer, um, Doug Weaver as the editor and myself, we never sat at the same table. It was all through Zoom calls. I learned how to edit on my own. Um, what Doug would send back to me, and he says, "Does this sound like this? so?" I can get back in and I can I can edit through pages. And we figured out a way to, to make it all happen: scanning and sending things back and forth. Uh, it really he had great insight as to where we should print and not be overseas. Didn't want to be in a queue with the supply chain issues that were coming out of China, not being able to get stuff out of Mexico. Uh, so we printed in the United States. I was really I wanted it to be a book that Mr. Pulver would be proud of have is in his hands as far as the quality of the paper chosen. We printed on hundred weight paper and I wanted to print in the United States because I wanted to support United States business, but I also didn't want to wait in a queue behind things that were coming in internationally and not be able to get my product out when I wanted to, when I wanted to be able to put it in people's hands. That's great. Um, let's go back to Mr. Pulver. Um, you write in the introduction to your book that quote, Mr. Pulver's knowledge needs to be shared because it is timeless and has so many applications, not just in sports, but in education, business, and finding some balance in a, in a world that sometimes seems to be, you know, it's spinning out of control like COVID. So that got us thinking, if Mr. Pulver were alive today, what do you think he would write in a letter to our leaders about dysfunctional Washington? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Pulver was always big on accountability and uh, being responsible for your own actions, your own preparation and your and the repercussions, good and bad of your decisions. And I think he would really stress and be disappointed that there's not much accountability for decisions that are made and people just, oh, well, that didn't work. We'll just pass it along, kick it down the road. Uh, he was really big on being responsible. And I think that's something we're, we're sorely lacking. I, I think too, he was such a decent man and some of that decency is gone. And I think also he would, he would remember what made this country so great. And it was a pride in who we are, how we got here, um, and just 
being good to your fellow man, just being decent. So also reading through letters to your future champion, you see a lot of important moments. We just touched on one, certainly with your book, you know, had um, important connections to PRI's home state of California. So what are a couple of your most memorable experiences playing here in the Golden State? Well, one of them was an opportunity I didn't get to play. So in 1984, I was the low amateur in the U.S. Women's Open, and that got me an invitation to play the following spring at the Nabisco Dinosaur. And I didn't have the money to do it. So I had to pass on the invitation. So I think winning that event, um, having the scoring average still stand, or the scoring record for that event still stand really means a lot because I, it was something I couldn't do. I couldn't afford to go to go from South Carolina, where I was in school, out to California to play for that, that week. But I think um, I go back to Pebble Beach. We played there in the Patty Sheehan Invitational in the spring of 1987. And it's still the only golf course when I've actually been in competition that I took photographs of and I still have them. It was a really cool event. We played the first two rounds at Fort Ord and then went down and, and played Pebble for the final round. And our and our team coming out of winter in South Carolina, we actually played quite well. So that was that was certainly a standout. And my first event with CBS was um, was at San Diego at Torrey Pine. So those really really stand out. And I I played well in California. (laughs) I played really good golf in California and I loved going West uh, because I was, I was anxious to get the season going. The first major was always sort of hanging there and it was, it was a good time for me. My mom always tells the story. My grandfather was, uh, he loved to play golf. And one time they, he got to play at Pebble Beach. This must've been in the mid to late sixties, some time in there. And the infamous 18th hole, he gave up. He just threw the ball away and walked <laughs> off. And said, I give up. Well, they, of, they often say that um, if you're going to hit it left at Pebble Beach, your nearest drop is Tokyo. So don't miss it left. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dottie, with, with the holiday season upon us, let's talk about some of your favorite books. Uh, we know that you and your husband are, are big World War II history buffs, and it inspires you to with your tra- your travel plans and even the name of your beloved dog Rupert. So what got you interested right. in and so passionate about World War II history? And what is your favorite World War II book? What have you enjoyed that you would recommend to our listeners for their holiday shopping list? Well, my, my interest was certainly peaked back as a as a youngster. Both my grandfather, Thurlow Woodcock, my mom's dad, um, served in the Pacific Theater. And then my godmother's dad, Frank Manzi, served in the in the um, in the European theater. Uh, he was he was a gunner uh, and flew missions on D-Day. So uh, sitting on the back porch listening to them tell stories about their their time uh, as soldiers in World War II definitely uh, got my interest. Um, and then when I was able to, and I guess more toward the European theater is I think that's we spent more time in social studies class and home for whatever reason in at Saratoga High School, more on the European theater. And it really was something I loved reading about. And as I had the uh, ability to go to Normandy twice, uh, I, I could, you know, five day trips aren't, aren't enough. And I, sometimes people say, oh yeah, we went, we did the, we did the beaches and we were there for an afternoon. It's like, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> you need to get off the beaches and you need to really dive into where, um, where everything moved from, from those first couple of weeks um, after, after D-Day. Um, it, it was, um, it was something that was, that was really personal. And some of my favorite books, I, I, I actually, I just finished um, Agent Josephine, Josephine Baker, that was written by Damian Lewis, just absolutely outstanding. Um, and there's one that's no longer in print anymore. You can still find it used, and it's by a guy who lives in Saratoga Springs now for for the summer. His name is Paul Orff, as part Orfite when his family was was in Italy, uh, and he came to this country and having no command of English, he went to this came to this country via South America, escaping Hitler Mussolini in Italy, and ended up being not only going to Purdue. University, University, but being the chairman of Dow Chemical. So to me, it's it's a lesson in what you can do if you put your mind to it and the opportunities that are here in this country. It's just absolutely fascinating. Um, but I've also, I'm also a big fan of The Yellow Star. It was written by a Saratoga Springs woman um, by the name of Jennifer Roy. And she, it is in the third person ta- spoken from her, her uh, excuse me, her aunt Sylvie, who escaped 
survived um, one of the ghettos. Um, just it was one of us, a handful of children to survive one of the ghettos. And it was just um, really amazing what people can do when there is a, a spirit of survival. So PRI, of course, puts out our holiday book list every year to, to give our readers some idea for the, the book lovers on their holiday shopping list. So last year, Dottie's book was at the top of our list. What book or books are at the top of Dottie's list this year that she'd uh, recommend to our listeners? So this one, I did a book signing in Saratoga Springs at, at the Cafe Lena about six weeks ago, and I pre- co-presented with a guy by the name of Ray O'Connor. And this is his book. She called him Raymond. His 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 story of his mother, who was married to a United States serviceman, and they were married one year. She got the knock on her door from the folks from Washington, D.C., from the service, saying that her husband had been shot down and, and did not survive. Um, fell in love with another serviceman, and she named her son after her first husband, but never told him until he was an adult. So it's it's his story about the man that his mother loved. So it's a really special, we co-presented, and he got to tell the story of his book first and you know, I'm like this oh my gosh so he gave me this book and that's going to be when we actually go to California in a couple of weeks for my uh my husband's 100th birthday for his grandmother that's that's in my backpack um another one that I, I read uh, in the past couple of years is called The Perfect Nazi by Martin Davidson fascinating a uh, younger younger man Scott uh, had questions about his grandfather so there were some things that didn't match up with the, the timing of the, the family tree the timeline and it turns out his his grandfather was way, way up in the Nazi organization. And um, and he peeled the layers of that onion away and was able to tell the story of his grandfather. Daddy, those are great picks. I wrote them all down and checked them out on Amazon as you were chatting. <laughs> so, so finally, we call our podcast next round because of our proximity to wine country here at PRI and our love of discussing policy ideas over a glass of California wine. So what wine, beer, cocktail, or other beverage are you drinking this year to, to celebrate? Celebrate the success of your terrific book. So we are big fans of Niner, which is more toward Paso, uh, but also uh, of Robert Foley. And if I had to celebrate a particular anything, I think it would be with a bottle of Bob Foley Claret. And it's just a great story. So it's a very small operation, just Bob and his wife. I think one, maybe two other full-time employees. And I went to a, a dinner where Bob spoke a couple of years and, and years ago, and people were asked, asked questions. And, and one of the questions was, well, Bob, after you've been in the fields, or you've been working all day on, on your wine, what do you like to drink? And he said, you're probably going to think wine, right? And he said, no, I like a cold beer when I come in off the fields during the day. But he said, we do have Chardonnay or white in our in our line now. And he said, I can tell you why. He said, because my wife said the beer made me fat. So, so they now have a very, very good Chardonnay. And I would also say I got a I got a box, a special box yesterday from Christy Kerr, who is LPGA uh, tour player, major, major championship winner. And Christy has Kerr Cellars and Christy's wines are very good. And I've got six bottles as a gift from her. So we will be um, cellaring some, but we will enjoy one just to see what we got. Thank you so much, Dottie, for a fascinating interview. Thanks. It was really fun. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.